back. Um, thanks for this wonderful opportunity. This is a great network to speak to um, for what I do uh, because it really is a way of tapping into the system at a very high level and at a very broad level. Uh, I just uh, compliment Ceres on the 25th anniversary and the extraordinary work that you've done um, over those 25 years. Pretty young organisation compared to Mindy and I, but you know, you, you're coming along pretty well. Look, I want to kind of take you back, if you like, to the 50 years ago kind of idea in this space, right? And, and we heard from Rachel Carson, from Limits to Growth, all those years ago, that you know, if we don't change, if we don't dramatically change the way we do things, then there's going to be consequences. And there have been clear warnings over many, many decades now as to what that change will look like if we don't respond. And so I think it's important just to begin my comments by just reminding us kind of where we are today. And this is what I do now. You know, I have the luxury um, at the University of Cambridge and in my work with <coughs> large companies and so on to really think about the whole system. So I do spend my time, which most of you haven't got the luxury of doing, looking at and thinking about and reading about everything in the space. So sustainability, economics, civilization writ large. And so in kind of 10 minutes, we're going to go through the future of civilization. So it's going to be pretty quick. <coughs> um, now, 50 years ago, in that context, we said there's going to be consequences. Today, we're at the point of consequences. That, it's really important to, to kind of be optimistic about this issue, but to recognize where we are today, honestly. Where we are today, honestly, is that we're seeing the global system, and by the system, I mean the economy, society, the human system of civilization breaking down. Right? We're seeing the system straining at such a level that if you looked at this from outer space or from the future, you'll say, my God, were they not paying any attention at all? Wasn't it so clear and so obvious? All the things that we, we've been warned about, resource wars, conflict over resources, battles over resources, resource constraint being writ large across the system now, as we see, for example, you know, the Middle East uprisings, the Arab Spring, and most tragically at the moment, the war in Syria, being very directly triggered by and driven by, exacerbated by resource constraint, in particular in that case, food prices. You go back a few years before the war in Syria, you can see in US intelligence reports talking about the fact that there's a severe drought, climate change induced, it's going to result in a million people, small farmers moving into cities, creating tensions in the system and therefore creating political instability. Right? So these things are very directly related and that's what since we talked about the system, you know, suffering under this strain would look like. We're seeing conflict over resource, resource wars, resource grabbing happening around the world as China correctly and legitimately is going around the world, you know, buying up countries effectively for farmland to feed their people. Right? That's the sort of thing we talked about that would happen at this time if we didn't change. Right? We're seeing climate change accelerating, frankly, out of control. Uh, and, and all the forecasts that we made, the IPCC and so on, have all proven to be not just correct, but understating badly the consequences. Right, so when I go to a polar ice expert like Peter Wadhams at the University of Cambridge and talk to him about the fact that the IPCC said 2100 was when the North Pole sea ice would melt and now we're looking at maybe 2050, isn't that terrifying? He said, no, that's not terrifying. I think the North Pole sea ice will all be gone within a couple of years. Right, now, he may or may not be right. The point is that the system is breaking down at that scale that we're not understanding. We're not thinking about it at that scale. Right, we're also seeing the economic system in serious trouble. We are seeing, I think, as a direct relationship, growth being constrained, right? We're seeing growth stalled in most Western countries and only really happening at all because we're borrowing yet more from the future, not just ecologically, but economically, to pump prime the economy to keep it going long enough in this desperate hope that if we keep on doing the same thing over and over again, we'll get a different result, right? The common definition of insanity. Uh, so we're looking at this process, we're looking at inequality galloping completely out of control, right? So 60% of the new income generated in the US in the last 30 years has gone to 1% of the people. Now, this is what historically leads to revolutions, right? You don't just keep on consolidating wealth, right, in an aristocracy, right? This is what happened in history quite a few times, and it turns out pretty badly for the aristocracy normally, right? So this is not just, like, unethical, this is stupidity. Right? This is insanity where those who are in charge are saying, come and get us, because right? we're going to keep on doing it until you stop us. Right? And that, that is not the behaviour of a rational, intelligent, advanced civilization, which is how we think of ourselves as being. 
So I'm not going to leave you here, don't worry, but I want you to sit here for a minute <laughs> and think about the fact that this is what we know. These are not assertions, this is what the facts say that we are at today. We are at a point where the global economic system, social system, the infrastructure on which we depend is falling apart. Now, that's an important place to sit because <clears throat> that's the context we're in today. This is no longer about incremental change. This is about a very clear choice because there's really only two places we can go to from here. One, which by the way is the most common traffic I get from colleagues, both scientific friends and the few nutters who write to me every day, um, who talk about the fact right, that we are on the edge of civilization breakdown and collapse is the most likely outcome. People write to me from all sorts of levels of expertise, right, from the top scientists and economists in the world through to, you know, just average people and some people on the outside of average as well, um, who say, we're just stupid, right, we are doomed, it is all over, right, this is the inevitable collapse of civilizations that we've seen through history. Now, I think that's wrong, but let's be clear, there are some very smart people who think that. And that's a choice that we now get to make. We get to choose to, you know, bet on which of these outcomes is going to occur. Right? And it's important to recognize today that we are all choosing. Right? We get to choose when we have to kind of bet on, not, not which one we'll, we'll do, but which one will occur. Because if you're an investor, a manager, an organizational, you know, um, person thinking about these issues, you need to think about what is your worldview? Is your worldview that we will face collapse, look at it coming at us, observe the data and go, oh well, that's a shame. <laughs> Shit happens. We're having a bad day, you know. Um, but can you really imagine us doing that, is my question to you. Can you really imagine that we're going to look at all that and say, yeah, that's just the way it's going to be. What a shame. Right? This is the end of civilization as we know it. No, we're not going to do that. But if we think we're going to do that, then you better decide we're going to do that, because the only choice we have apart from that is to radically transform the global economy right, at a scale that is actually fairly hard to imagine today. But that's where we are. That's the only choices we have. We either head towards collapse and accelerate over the cliff and hope to learn to fly before we hit the bottom, which is unlikely, or we say we've got to fix it. Now let's look at what fixing it looks like and let's pick an example of climate change, which is kind of the, the sharp edge of the issue, but just an example of the broader problem. On climate change, we know that fixing it looks like keeping the Earth's temperature increase above pre-industrial times to less than two degrees. I would argue one degree is actually an intelligent response, but let's accept two degrees as the framework that most of the world's governments and companies have accepted. To stop warming below, to keep warming below two degrees, we have to, and I'll say this for you slowly, eliminate the coal, oil and gas industries from the economy inside 20 years. Right? So 20 years right, to take out one of the world's biggest industries and replace it. Impossible to imagine. Impossible to imagine. And as Nelson Mandela says, it always seems impossible until it's done. Now, what we're looking at in that context is to take out the world's, one of the world's biggest industries and replace it with a better one, with a cleaner one, right, with one that we think is not going to threaten the future of civilization, that we think is not going to threaten the world food supply, and is going to, as a result, serve our economy and our society much better. Now, is that hard to imagine? It's very hard to imagine until you look at what's happening today in the energy market and you see the extraordinary growth in solar, the extraordinary price drops in solar, the way renewables, as Mindy talked about, is actually now dominating the energy industry, and we're looking at reports from Alliance, Alliance Bernstein, from many investment houses saying, we are now at the point where we are seeing a disruptive change in the market. A great article in The Economist recently talked about the, Ameri the European utility um, sector losing half a trillion dollars in value in the last five years because they missed the trends happening in energy efficiency and renewables. Right? Major disruptive change occurring in the market. Allianz Bernstein talked about the fact that solar now competes with oil, gas and coal in most of Asia. They talked about, which is this, is this is where you start thinking about what's possible, they talked about the potential for energy deflation inside a decade. Right? Now no one knows how these technology things unfold. The point is that very smart, very well informed people are talking about a level of disruption in the energy market which is incomprehensible to today's major players. I say that to you just to make the point that I think you know, we are on the edge of the transformation that we need to fix this. And what it means is dramatic change in the energy markets, dramatic change in the global economy, trillions of dollars of destroyed value. So if you own that you want to kind of pay attention. 
and trillions of dollars of created value, which likewise you want to pay attention to. And you either believe this is possible, or you believe that collapse is the most likely outcome for civilization. And either of those is, a, is an arguable investment strategy, but you better make sure you decide which one you're going for. Right, because collapse strategy is a very different investment approach than, than transformational strategy, and one of them is kind of a bit harder to live with. Um, so let me just stop there and just summarize my kind of main arguments before we go to the panel. The, this is the point where we make the decision. This is where we decide if we choose to save ourselves from collapse. I think we're going to, I think it's inevitable that we do so, and by the way, it's what we always do as humanity. We wait for the crisis to get really bad, we wait until the last possible moment, then we wait for a bit longer, and then we respond. <laughs> World War II, any number of personal health crises, company crises, is what we always do, is what we'll do in this occasion, is we will respond. So therefore, it's gonna happen a lot faster than you expect. It's going to happen more dramatically than most people expect. It's gonna be like markets always are, chaotic, messy, and ugly, and effective. Right? And if you choose to be on the right side of the market and the right side of history, then you're part of that solution. If you don't, then I think you're going to lose. Right? And I think that we're going to have to recognise that we are talking about a transformation, which means not feel good, hold hands, march into sunset singing Kumbaya, corporate responsibility. We're talking about the ugly, brutal, creative destruction of capitalism, where we're going to wipe out large parts of the economy and replace it. And that, I think, is a bloody good thing. Right, and it's the reason markets work, it's the reason this group is so important, and I think it's the opportunity of the civilization. Thank you.